ఫ్యాకల్టీన్ the science and believe in science to come out of this uh, difficult times and i'm glad to see my co speakers uh, um, a wonderful line i think uh, professor saigopal sir i think uh, again nice to see you sir and an excellent lineup of speakers you have and then uh, today my job will be probably just to introduce the concept uh, the pharmaceutical and therapeutic uh, perspective of covid 19 so that uh, 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 the other speakers will dwell into more details of the topic virology clinical trials and vaccines and everything we have full uh, three days of uh, uh, talks uh, um, on this so i will provide a glimpse of uh, the the ongoing uh, uh, developments and then will be available to answer the questions based on the time so most of my talk will be uh, centered on the, the emerging uh, uh, scientific virological facts of covid-19 you know how it spreads how we can prevent and then uh, what are the current treatments and then common tips uh, for prevention so i think uh, if you see uh, today's world uh, numbers you know 172000 positive cases today and then 5700 people lost their lives worldwide in india i think 19000 positive cases today 438 people died today this is 5700 people every day dying worldwide you know uh, nearly 500 deaths in india are too many for this virus so uh, we can we can just say this is one of the global uh, health crisis of our generation as uh, there is no vaccine yet and then we are struggling to find an effective drug treatment so my talk will mainly center on uh, these aspects so this is where i work at xnm you know stem privileged uh, and thankful to them for letting me to do the research there and uh, i'll focus in the next 40 minutes or so the coronavirus origin the pandemic and then the covid-19 from virology to disease diagnosis and how it spreads and how we can prevent and then current developments for vaccines and antiviral medicines and you know, today this is i would take you through the journey of a comparative uh, statistics between united states and india about the covid-19 uh, this is not june 20 this is july 1st today as you can see in the united states we started uh, uh, early uh, the pandemic and then number of cases were stabilized nearly 25000 cases all the way until uh, end of june then again now we are entering to another surge so right now we are in nearly 40000 cases uh, per day so india there were not many cases in february march and up to april and then uh, from may i think you were in a rapid surge right now it's uncontrollable uh, 19000 per day and it might go to all the way to 50000 and 1 lakh cases per day you don't know where you're heading so uh it's not a first pandemic that we are witnessing many pandemics happen in the history you know if you see 200 million people died uh, in 13th century with uh, with plague bubonic plague and smallpox uh, uh, kind of took away 56 million people uh, in 15th century and in the spanish flu at the early uh, 19th century 1920s nearly 40 to 50 million people died there's a plague of uh, uh, justinian and hiv and then uh, there were so i think uh, uh, the, the human kind has witnessed a lot of bacterial and viruses pandemics and we have overcome uh, through learning science so the corona virus uh, is is no exception so we will learn so in sanskrit uh, it's called corona mahamari so it is originated from china a province called wuhan and then and with the first case of pneumonia and then who uh, declared uh, as a pandemic i think uh, uh, around um, uh, uh you know december it was reported to them and then so once uh, 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 all countries were alerted then you know it started started spreading despite our best effort so uh, even though india went to lockdown uh, multiple times so you will not be able to control it 
So we see uh, right now the statistic size of today. So we have nearly 10 million confirmed cases and nearly uh, half a million deaths. So 515,000, 515, so which is equal to 5%. But quite a few people record, you know, 5.4 million people record, which is 51%. So record is very good. So these are the number of countries that have more than 1 lakh cases, all the way from Canada on the bottom and US on the top. So US continue to be the number one victim. And India became number four with nearly uh, 5.8 lakh cases. So uh, 2.6 million act, uh, confirmed cases in the US, nearly 128,000 pe people dying, 5% mortality rate, and there's a 27% uh, recovery. So India, now you have nearly 5.8 uh, uh, lakh cases, and nearly 17,000 deaths, which is equal to 3%, and a, a good recovery of 60%. So the top states where you have problem, these are the top 10 states, you know, and the state where I originated, Telangana, is number eight with 16,000 cases size of today. And then Andhra Pradesh, where you are located, uh, 14,000 cases continue to be number 10 state in India. So the problem is very high. So comparatively, the death rate is comparable uh, worldwide in the US and India. I don't know how accurately you're reporting. I mean, you know, now that you're entering, you might hit the 5%, just like we saw in the US and global. And recovery rate is pretty much similar, you know, worldwide is 51% and the U.S. continue to have a second surge, so we have recovery rate less, but uh, India recovery rate is no better than the worldwide recovery rate, okay? So have that in mind. What is coronavirus, you know, how does it look like? You know, you've seen in the TV commercials everywhere all the last 120 days, you know, this is a picture that is in your mind, like, like a rubber ball structure, with like spikes everywhere, and if you cut, you see uh, inside uh, the RNA genomic uh, material. So uh, this is a virus particle, which uh, uh, structurally is a very simple uh, a particle. So it has a little envelope and then these spike proteins and then a few other uh, membrane, pro I mean, envelope proteins. So you have positive strand RNA inside that is infectious material that uh, can translate and then replicate uh, uh, itself. So uh, probable origin is from China. Uh, from bats because the gene uh, SARS-CoV-2 is the scientific name given by the gene bank for this virus, which is 96% similar to bat co uh, rtg 13 sequence. So the probable origin is uh, for the bats and then it's 96% identical to earlier SARS-CoV-1 that we witnessed in 2003, but it's not at all similar that much uh, in its uh, uh, um, virology to Mars that we saw in 2012. Sometimes it's called Wuhan virus and Chinese virus, but the WHO said this is a coronavirus disease 2019. So we simply call COVID-19. So this is not a living cell it itself. It's a virus particle, but it needs living cells for multiplication. And that's where we understand how it spreads and uh, what it takes to, to contain. So coronavirus belongs to a big family of alpha coronaviruses, beta and gamma. We don't have that many pathogenic uh, alpha and gamma, but the beta coronavirus that presents the SARS-CoV, SARS-CoV-2, and then MERS, uh, they belong to beta coronaviruses. And uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 has a bigger mortality rate than what we have seen with SARS-CoV-1 that was very big, very well contained. And then MERS was also very well contained despite 35% mortality. Uh, uh, that they haven't seen this big problem. So structurally, I think it's a very simple uh, envelope, the spherical particle, which uh, uh, has a genomic material inside the RNA, and then uh, it has these, uh, uh, you know, peplomers, uh, the glycoprotein spikes that actually helps attaching to the human cells. So basically, you have 74 sort of surface spikes uh, uh, divided into S1 and S2 subunit, and then S1 is uh, the, the receptor binding domain, and S2 is the, the lipid one. And it doesn't have that many genes, you know, the structural genes like spike, envelope, membrane, and nucleic acid, and the axillary genes include the, the RNA polymerase and exo uh, nuclease, exoribonuclease. So very simple uh, in structure. And then if you see the size of it, it's about uh, uh, 70 to 80. That means nearly about 100 nanometer in size, uh, which is 80,000 times less in, uh, than in a human hair. You can't see one, so you need an electron microscope. So it's a very uh, uh, um, uh, rapidly replicating virus. It enters the lung cells, lung epithelial cells, and then uh, it lodges in the lungs. So mainly by attaching itself to AC2 receptors. 
That's how it enters the cells and then replicates within hours and days and causes cause lung damage. So the AC receptors determines the extent where it can infect cells. So the AC is a, is a, is a, is a is an enzyme converting to enzyme protein uh, receptor, and uh, uh, most of the infection happens in the in the in the lungs. You see this picture, for example, this is uh, the epithelial cell. You know, thousands of uh, virus particles are replicating and oozing out uh, from the cell. So, if you see the multiplication cycle, you know, a virus entering by attaching to AC receptor and uh, assisted by the transmembrane. Um, serine protease, so the entry and fusion are, you know, uh, very uh, uh, coordinated steps. So once the vi virus enters these our uh, lung epithelial cells, then it just uncoats itself and this uh, viral material comes out. And then once this RNA is, is in the cytoplasm, it is ready to translate by using uh, our translational machinery in the cell. So it hijacks the entire cellular machinery to translate the proteins. One of the first few proteins it will do is RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, and then it will replicate itself, and then it can also translate into structural protein, and then it will assemble to, you know, thousands of other uh, particles, and then come out, uh, assembly and endocyte, I mean, uh, exocytosis. So once it comes out to extracellular milieu, it uh, inflicts a cytokine storm, a massive inflammatory state where you have interleukin, cytokinins, and then that's what is killing people uh, more than anything else. So if you see the, one of the fatal viruses, RNA virus is known because it's 10 to 15 times more virulent than a flu virus and a very high community risk and no treatment available. And it infects the alveolar epithelial cells. And then if you see, for example, this is a cultured uh, lung epithelial cells released by NIH. So a, a thousands of millions of particles are coming out of these cells and then they pretty much uh, eat the cells. So cells will be dead soon. And then more and more cells will be dead. That means one, one is unable to breathe. So basically, it's a life-eating virus. That's why it's called a killer virus, because life is nothing but breathing. If you can't breathe, you can't supply oxygen, so you're dead. So that's what uh, uh, it's causing. So how it enters the cell? So it enters the cell by attaching itself to AC2 receptors uh, in certain places where these receptors are present. For example, alveolar cells, kidney, cholangiocytes in the bile, and gut enterocytes. So for example, in the alveolar cells, uh, it attaches to AC2 receptors. And uh, these are the main receptors for co uh, COVID, I mean, SARS-CoV-2. And as you know, angiotensin converting enzyme 2 is very essential for splitting angiotensin 2 into other angiotensin products, which are protective in the lungs. Not only you deprive these protective agents, you massively build up angiotensin 2, and as a result, you cause inflammation and pulmonary edema in the lungs, and then increased pulmonary embolism and could be sudden death. And then other things is the pneumonia and then uh, the related uh, problem that leads to uh, the infection. So uh, the SARS-2 virus enters our cells wherever there is a AC2 receptor. So AC2 receptors are present in the human and monkey so far, is absent in the rats, cats, and most of the animals, including dogs. So present in the secretory globular cells in our nose, and then you know, type 2 pneumocytes in the lungs, and then absorbed to enterocytes. So these are very efficient cells that can take up uh, this virus. And uh, uh, in terms of the mutation, yes, it is mutating, but not uh, as much as we see in the flu viruses. So it's a, a more or less a stable a gene uh, RNA uh, virus because it has a, a, a proofreading enzyme that is making it stable. But small mutations are, are, are evident, but they're not functionally dominant. So uh, compared to SARS, uh, uh, where it spread through bats, and MARS, uh, where it spread through intermediate camels, uh, uh, through different type of receptors uh, to enter the cell. And this one is you know, uh, highly variable in mortality and uses very high affinity AC2 receptor that makes it one of the most dangerous respiratory virus that we have ever seen. So the most virulent, pathogenic, and infectious, and just transmits through aerosolized transmission, and exclusively human or primate has a host and very stable. That she makes it very concerning. How it spreads? You have seen in the news and everywhere. So this virus enters our body through nose and mouth, and it lodges in the lungs and multiplies rapidly. So the primary route is aerosolized direct inhalation of the air contaminated with the virus. If someone who has a COVID infection, if he coughs, sneezes, spit, and laugh, and talk, these particles 
uh, get aerosolized and then if you are within six feet of distance you inhale this uh, uh, air contaminated with this virus and then you get infected all you need is 15 minutes of exposure to this contaminated air and then the indirect route is these these aerosolized particles will settle down on on objects so when you touch these objects containing these fomites like doors elevators pens cloths utensils anywhere the virus will settle down and then you touch your mucous membranes of the eye nose and mouth then virus enters your your nose and mouth and then gets back into the epithelial cells so how long uh, the virus stays in the air this is airborne okay and you know, don't believe in all the news and everywhere that say hey, it's not airborne yes it is airborne it can this virus is viable and can survive in the air up to three hours in the in the, in the form of these aerosols so it mainly spreads from asymptomatic persons because symptomatic persons are anyway isolated or in the hospital the asymptomatic persons are the problem right now they were not tested they're also signed but they continue to transmit so the secondary route of contamination is very very important we can easily take care of it because this on the surface this virus can survive such as on copper vessels four hours cardboard like you know shipping 24 hours and on your cloths 24 hours and steel uh, utensils nearly two to three days and shopping uh, bags like plastic two to three days so you can clean these so can avoid the contamination but know that the virus is viable for this long so it helps understanding uh, uh, reduction the spread you have learned about the signs and symptoms you know anywhere from 2 to 13 days of incubation time and average five days to show symptoms in symptomatic people so you now categorize people showing symptoms and people not showing symptoms so asymptomatic people we're not talking about uh, them right now because they are not identified we don't know the symptoms the symptomatic people you see break of high fever and shortness of breath these are the very characteristic features you also see smell loss of smell so the dry cough uh, uh, it happens because it irritates the lungs and then high fever is because of the cytokine storm and everything and shortness of breath because your cells in the lungs are dying so uh, you can't breathe and then the fatigue and body pain starts and then the cytokine storm the lympho, lympho, lymphania and then pneumonia sets in and then death happens because of multiple organ failure from the systematic inflammation in quite a few people there's a pulmonary embolism they don't have this pneumonia or anything but they have sudden death you know there's a blood clot in the in the in the arteries in the, in the lungs so acute worsening happens very rapidly so uh, can't underestimate if someone only having mild symptoms they can rapidly progress and die uh, that's what uh, is happening so you had to understand that the largest cases are asymptomatic cases we don't know because we don't test them and they are the main culprits for spreading the virus symptomatic cases constitutes only a fraction and very severe cases are a small fraction and of that only a few people are dying so age-wise if you see the asymptomatic people are mostly young people and mostly women and those who have a good lung a liver and a, a lung function and those who shed less virus and then those who can recover fast without showing signs and symptoms they have high lymphocyte count they have, that means they have very good immunity and anybody who doesn't have these like you know aged people and then you know those who have liver injury high viral shedding you know slow recovery in the lungs and low lymphocyte count these are the people symptomatic and showing unable to mount the immunity and they are the one that are sucking me if you see the infection prognosis, uh, uh, generally most of the cases are very mild. So it's not a re really danger of concern uh, because 80% of the people are only showing mild symptoms. They can be cared at home. And then the remaining 20%, you know, you have 15% severe cases. And sometimes they need hospital stay for two to three weeks and they all recover most of the time. In that, I think you have 5% critical. These are the people who are dying. So they might stay in the hospital for a very, very long time because they are the ones unable to have immunity. So they develop pneumonia and then acute respiratory distress syndrome, and they need ventilator support. Despite ventilator support, you know, at least 50% of them are dying who are in the ventilator. So uh, uh, when to seek care, you know, uh, you should assess symptoms and then understand your options. And if you're exposed in the office or you know, anywhere, if you have symptoms, if you have immune or health condition, any risk, you should immediately seek uh, medical help. So the game plan, have a game plan because uh, designate one person in your home and imagine if someone gets you a uh, positive in your home, how to handle it. 
So call your doctor, self-isolate, and then make sure you don't uh, contaminate or spread to the aged people or risk people in your home. So it happens to children, adults, and elderly, but I think uh, the high risk groups are diabetic people and blood pressure people, cancer, heart disease, asthma, lung, liver, and kidney disease, and immunosuppression. These are the people who die most, not the youngsters, not women, not children. So who are dying mostly? The people who are dying mostly are proportional to the age. Higher the age, more death. So for example, in a 5% uh, uh, less than 54 age, 55 to 60, then 12 percent. People who are aged 65 and high are more uh, dying, you know, 21, 27, 33 percent. So if someone is about 80 years old, uh, certainly I think they are going to die of this disease if they get uh, positive. And even youngsters or adults who have hypertension and diabetes, these people are dying in disproportionate number because they are unable to cope up with this COVID virus. So the detection and testing is mainly uh, through the, the RT-PCR test, you know, the specimens where the viral load is present because it's largest in the lungs. So it is shed through saliva, sputum, and nasal fluid and lung fluid. And you can't uh, test this viral load in, in blood or urine. So you can do in the stools as well. So the gold standard test is RT-PCR. So you take nasal swab and then do the mRNA detection uh, by real-time PCR. Uh, it's a very slow test, it's the most accurate. And uh, uh, you can do it anytime at exposure time, but because of the slowness and tediousness, uh, you can do the high throughput. So that's why they said uh, antibody detection is the faster. So it's a, it's a ELISA-based you know, colorimetric detection of IgM and IgA uh, detection. But it's very less accurate, and then you can detect in 15 to 30 minutes. But the problem is that you had to wait for five to 14 days for the antibodies to to, to show up. So sometime you know you might not get accurate results. So RTPCR continues to be the test of choice. So it's present in the in the nasal pharyngeal, you know, and in the stools, and in the sputum. So it's present in the stools for very extended time, you know, all the way, you know, uh, one week to six weeks uh, during the infection. So uh, this is a curve that you see the the viral load, and this is a curve that you see the antibody low, uh, mounting IgG and IgMs. So right now the the medical treatment uh, is uh, mostly symptomatic, uh, uh, you know, because there is no specific treatment approved by US FDA. So the top supportive treat is mainly fluid uh, giving fluids to make sure the lung, liver, and heart function, vital organs are maintained. If one cannot breathe, uh, give oxygen support, and then medicines to control the temperature, and then uh, uh, put uh, put them on the mechanical ventilation if they show uh, ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome. So uh, vaccines are underway, and then one question everybody is asking these days is, is the vaccine viable? Yes, you're all biotechnology students and faculty, you know how does it work? So most cases, like you know, 80% of the mild and moderate cases, they're all recovering. So recovery is based on the antibody uh, presence uh, in these people. Anywhere from five to 10 or 20 days, there's a rapid surge in the IgG's production, IgM and IgG's that have COVID neutralizing capabilities. So uh, based on this, we can say that vaccine is viable. Now you need to come out with the appropriate antigen. And current uh, estimate is that uh, vaccine is viable and the antibodies might stay uh, 15 to 28 months. And re reinfection possibility is very low at this time, uh, based on our understanding of SARS and MARS. So who are the ones that were not benefiting or you may not benefit from the vaccine or the severe people or people in the intensive care unit where they are unable to have good immunity status. So their antibody production is very low uh, despite a uh, uh, long time fighting with the virus. So these are, these are the people that uh, quite a few recover 15%, but there'll be 5% or more deaths because these are unable to kind of cope up with the infection. So vaccine is the best long-term strategy to end the pandemic. And currently I think uh, uh, there's no approved vaccine and nearly over 100 are in the early testing. So uh, as you know, you need a good antigen source uh, to kind of uh, boost our immunity system to produce antibodies. So now uh, companies are using uh, uh, the S protein or RBD purified protein as an antigenic source. And then you know now there's a new way of producing uh, uh, you know vaccines through uh, the viral recombinant vectors uh, for a particular protein of uh, this uh, RNA virus, or you can even put them in a nanoparticle and then you know 
The older methods still are being used is killed or attenuated virus particles that could uh, kind of uh, stimulate antibody production. So, so far, I think two vaccines, uh, uh, we completed phase two and then others are still in the uh, early phase uh, trials. There's also a BCG vaccine uh, for non-specific protection. So uh, a few weeks ago, I think AstraZeneca got a big contract from US uh, to produce uh, um, the vaccine. So uh, as you know, the, uh, the, the antibodies when properly produced through a vaccine, so can neutralize uh, the coronavirus by opsonization, neutralization, agglutination. That's why you have to have a very healthy immune status. So your microphages can kind of uh, scavenge all of this and then clean the system. So the coronavirus vaccine status is right now, three vaccines candidates have reached the pivotal uh, testing. Pivotal testing is in phase three trials uh, that are the last step in our phase one, two, three trials. So three vaccines, the, the Moderna vaccine uh, is entering phase three in July, and then the Oxford and AstraZeneca, I think they scheduled for August. And then finally the Johnson and Johnson, and they are hoping to enter into phase three in September. So it will be a long way to go to finish phase three trials to see if uh, these vaccines are safe, first thing, and then they're effective. Can they mount enough uh, antibodies that have a capability to prevent uh, the coronavirus infection from happening? The proof of efficacy is a main hurdle. I think uh, that would uh, take a while uh, because these vaccines have to be given for healthy people. Those have to be challenged with the virus, and then now uh, you have to do analysis, you know, uh, how many people were challenged uh, or naturally exposed uh, or, or kind of um, didn't get infection or their viral loads are less or their antibody production is very good. So all of those surrogate measures have to be presented. And then, until then, I think there's a heavy effort on producing uh, and approving new antivirals or repurposed antivirals. So we are focusing only on the re repurposed right now because uh, the industry is mainly focusing to find the rapid. So quite a few agents are in development. You know, you see, for example, the early stage where you can block uh, the entry fusion and assembly uh, using agents such as, you know, Kimstad and then Arbidol or the, the popular chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. Uh, this is the most efficient step to block the entry of the virus into the cell. So then the other steps are, you know, protease inhibitors uh, to, to kind of uh, uh, stop the translation. Or, or you know polypeptide processing, or you know the RNA-dependent RNA, -dependent RNA uh, polymerase inhibitors uh, such as uh, the remdesivir and uh, the, the the favirapir, and then finally I think uh, we don't have very many uh, agents that could you know inhibit uh, further steps, but then we have the the immunoglobulin type of uh, agents, and then we have anti-inflammatory and anti-cytokinins to take care of the cytokine storm, for example you know anti-cytokinins. So quite a few agents are in development. So this is the current status of the antivirals. So if you divide these agents into antivirals and immunity boosters, so uh, the antivirals uh, are, are can be discussed uh, where they exactly act. So the earliest understanding is from studies uh, from using uh, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine that have a very good uh, uh, EC50 values to, to, to kind of suppress the multiplication of these virus, you know, nearly uh, six uh, micro, micro mole uh, hydroxychloroquine, and then it enters clinical trials. Uh, but then, you know, I didn't find any efficacy. So right now, I think uh, everybody is stopping clinical trials. The FDA uh, at the beginning gave emergency use authorization for hydroxychloroquine, but they withdrawn now because of lack of efficacy. So the other uh, promising compound is the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase remdesivir. And this is in an I right now phase three clinical trial showing some promise. Uh, and then the latest entry is uh, Favirapir uh, from Glenmark. Uh, that's uh, another uh, RNA uh, polymerase inhibitor. Other agents are still in, in uh, clinical trials, uh, like inhibitors of uh, TM, TM PRS2, uh, like Chemostad, and then the, the protease inhibitors like Lopinavir and Rotinavir. So uh, the three drugs that made headway so let's focus on you know, hydroxychloroquine. I mean, early clinical trials started, you know, in, I think in India, I think it's continued to be used as a prophylactic uh, once a week uh, dose for healthcare workers. I think ICMR recommended for its use. Even President Trump used that uh, demonstrating its efficacy. There's no question of uh, any problem with the efficacy because hydroxychloroquine has been used millions of people worldwide for malaria and other causes. 
So the uh, the safety uh, uh, issue that has controversial has been settled, but uh, now the main question is safety. I mean, the main question is efficacy. So uh, I think uh, quite a few studies recently have showed that I think it's not working that well as we imagined. So FDA has revoked the emergency use authorization on June 15, and both NIH and WHO has stopped the clinical trials of hydroxychloroquine. I think that is the end of the road for hydroxychloroquine for use in uh, COVID. So the other most promising drug is Remdesivir, uh, which is given intravenously, a uh, 200 milligram loading dose and for up to uh, 10 days. So I think uh, uh, it showed early uh, uh, signs of efficacy in phase two, right now it's in phase three trials. And uh, uh, there's a little bit of doubts for its efficacy. The latest entry, which is a kind of uh, uh, stunning uh, uh, in India, is the, the, Favira, the, the, the Favipiravir the, by the Glenmark, which is another RNA uh, polymerase inhibitor. So on June 10th, uh, they got approval from DCGI to use in mild to moderate cases. The remdesivir is only for severe cases in the intensive care unit, but this one can be given on an outpatient basis, the tablets. So a loading dose of 18, 1800, milli, 1800 milligrams a day, and then 800 milligrams uh, twice a day for uh, the next uh, 13 days. So uh, if you see the conspiracy is in early on, quite a few false reports have happened about hydroxychloroquine. You know, two papers have been since withdrawn from Lancet and Ring Run Medicine. Uh, some people early reported false data that, uh, uh, that it is a safety problem that people are dying. So these are three fraud, uh, uh, fraudulent authors, uh, uh, Sapan Desai and then Mandeep Mehra. Amit Patel produced uh, three papers uh, in, in, in Lancet and England on medicine. All three have been fired from their jobs uh, for fraudulent data, and then the papers have been withdra uh, withdrawn. So it is safe. There's no question about the safety of it. The only question of the efficacy is that uh, it's not proving to be efficacious. So uh, on that note, I think uh, um, uh, hydroxychloroquine still stands uh, as a safe drug. Coming to remdesivir, there is a big hype about the efficacy because it hasn't lived up to its expectation in the early trials. Even in the phase three right now, I think it is a very modest improvement uh, in the early data, 76% compared to 66% in the standard control. So I'm very marginal. Now, until we finish the phase three, we don't know how good it is. So that's why quite a few papers, quite a few media and everywhere, the question, the hype about the remdesivir uh, in the severe cases. It can only be used in severe cases, not mild or moderate cases. So now that's why I think there is a push for using uh, uh, other alternatives uh, such as the, the, uh, the anticytokinins and immunoglobulins. So, so there's a, a talk about uh, the anticytokine and the immuno, some of the, uh, the monoclonal antibodies. Um, See, the other breakthrough that happened uh, in the last two weeks is the corticosteroids. So earlier, I think you know, I recommended, everybody recommended not to use corticosteroids uh, because of the potent immunosuppression. But a little bit of uh, immunosuppression is essential for, the, for us to survive this cytokine storm. A low doses of dexamethasone, I think, increase the survival. This is the first drug to increase the survival, and uh, it's very encouraging development. So the plasma therapy is the last alternative. Nothing works. So, so convalescent plasma works. I mean, it has proven time and again because this is a plasma that has the, the soluble antibodies. So when you get it from the donor and give it to severely ill sick patients, I think it has the antibodies to fight the COVID and uh, it's, it's working. The problem is you don't have very many donors and then more controlled clinical trials are needed because you don't know the tighter of the antibodies, how much to give and uh, uh, how long to give. So those need to be done to a rigorous clinical trials. So I uh, think uh, somebody is establishing a corona drug database uh, in the United States. Uh, um, uh, uh, that's I uh, think I want to bring to your attention. So this shows uh, um, um, quite a few promising repurposed drugs. So uh, for now, I think uh, focus on misuse of drugs. You know, if you are a patient, you have blood pressure medication, the sugar, continue to take them, don't discontinue. But if you suspect anything, you don't misuse antibiotics on anyone because antibiotics are useless completely. Not only that, they decimate your microbiota, good bacteria in your, in your gut, so reduce immunity, you become more susceptible, okay? That applies to any of these antibiotics. 
So now we don't have a good uh, antiviral drug and we don't have a, a vaccine available. Our goal is to prevent the coronavirus so that way we can focus on two fundamental principles of microbiological uh, virological biosafety. That is risk assessment, risk containment. These are the two biosafety principles that we follow in our labs. We can implement that in the outside. So I was one of the first uh, earliest uh, uh, scientists to put an article on March 20, how to survive the corona pandemic even when it didn't even start in India. So I said, uh, you know, the best way is to stay away from the bug, okay? Because you once you're exposed, uh, there's no way you can es escape. The other way is to have a very good immunity, so stay healthy. So, the, so these are the two things that I suggest, and then, you know, uh, if you put them into pro proper perspective, so the 10 common uh, tips can be divided into two segments. One is stay away from the bug. That includes uh, the popular social distancing and then good hygiene and face and uh, stock of food things. The stay healthy thing is the six principles that are in your control to kind of improve your health. So let's see uh, now, how do you stay away from the bug? So that's why, because this virus spreads through aerosolized transmission, person to person, cough, uh, so, you know, sneeze and all. So you don't know who he has infection, who doesn't. So better stay away from persons six feet away. That's why they put social distancing. So um, that's why I think uh, uh, you don't go outside that much. And then even if you have to go put a mask and then follow all the uh, so physical distancing principles uh, to avoid being exposed. And then you can wash hands frequently because this virus uh, envelope is very susceptible it says very lipid pro lipid structure, so it can be it can be easily washed away. So very labile virus, so uh, it uh, it's mild soap water and also 60 or 70 percent alcohol you can denature it. So good hygiene includes uh, washing the vegetables, mailboxes, and la frequent laundering the cloths and everything. And then uh, don't touch the face that much or clean the face even when you go outside and come back because you know uh, that's how it enters your nose and mouth. And uh, uh, stock up uh, food supplies because you have to disinfectant uh, everything that comes into your home uh, with clean soap water or just water, you know, like milk bottles and you know everything before putting the refrigerator. So outside food does contain uh, the COVID virus. So when you eat, still you know, 0.5 percent of the virus can go into the intestine and can lodge. So no outside food, please. And then in terms of uh, staying healthy, these are the principles, just like soldiers fighting for, a, uh, heading for a war, you are all in the war zone right now, fighting these hidden enemy, the small virus particles. So you have to stay healthy. How do you stay healthy? The first principle is that you don't panic. We have a hope and resilience. So, you know, the humankind has seen very many tragedies. We survived everything. So have a hope and build immunity. So you can do puja, prayer, meditation, yoga, exercise, anything that helps you to stay focused. So I think uh, that's what a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, religious organizations and everybody uh, are focusing these days. So, and then, you know, I as a, a healthcare, you know, pharmacist, pharmacologist, we always uh, say, you know, have a simple and balanced food because it's important that uh, do not disturb your gastrointestinal tract, which is essential for a good immunity because your gut has a lot of microbiota, like uh, probiotics, uh, uh, the very essential bacteria that can uh, kind of uh, improve your immunity. So uh, take food, uh, colored food, vegetables, and then very balanced with at least 50 grams of protein every day, but uh, a lot of uh, fermented milk products, like, you know, the the Low yogurt, lassi, cheese, anything that, that can promote your probiotics. Like a glass of lassi in the morning and evening, homemade lassi is the best uh, uh, way to promote your probiotics. Minimize stress, emotional, physical, mental, because that will reduce your immunity. So you need to have good immunity uh, to mount, uh, I mean, to fight the COVID virus. Good sleep uh, to have a good uh, uh, buildup of immunity. At any cost, totally avoid alcohol. It not only injures the liver, uh, it, it reduces your ability to fight infection and completely stop smoking because you need a strong liver, a strong lungs uh, to kind of uh, um, face this virus. So you can do breathing exercises like pranayama and all those things. So despite your best efforts, so you had to be very careful. So masks are your best defense when you go outside uh, uh, so that you won't inhale 
the virus in the air. N95s are the best because N95 can filter 95% of aerosol particles of, of 0.3 microns and above. So these uh, uh, COVID particles of 0.1 micron, they cluster with the mucus. So even if five clusters, so 0.5 micron, this can be filterable through N95, but not through homemade fabric mask. So if you don't have N95, no problem. Make a fabric mask, four layers at least, cotton, polyester, silk in this row, not a single layer, okay? So put some hurdle to the virus when you're inhaling so that virus will be trapped here. So it, still this fabric mask can only uh, stop the large aerosolized particles. It cannot stop the, uh, um, the COVID particle, okay, the, the SARS-2 cov So you can still penetrate this layer and you can still inhale if you are in the room where there's a lot of people exposed. So. Copious things you can do is use uh, plenty of disinfectants, Lysol, Pine Salt, clean the surfaces, and then 70% of alcohol is most effective and mild water also. You know, stay, uh, at least you need three minutes uh, on the surface uh, to, to be effective. And the bleach is the best way to decontaminate the surfaces, uh, not the DDT or anything else, uh, just a bleach solution or Clorox wipes on the surfaces or, you know, contaminated areas. So the mitigation strategies, the, the public health interventions are very, very important. You know, on April 27th, uh, I published an article in the Indian Express about uh, at that time, you know, India didn't have this many cases, but in the United States, we are having a problem. So, so one of the things that uh, uh, everyone advocated at that time is uh, two things. One is testing and quarantining and social distancing. So testing and quarantine is still effective right now because you do more tests, you can isolate more people, reduce the risk. Okay, widespread testing is the single most important thing to kind of rapidly identify the people and isolate. If you don't, then they are the people who are doing the community spread. That's what you're witnessing in India. And social distancing, whether or not you have symptoms or not, can't reduce the contact with people. Okay, whether they are asymptomatic or symptomatic. So you reduce the spread, reduce the risk. There is no way you can contain the spread without these two uh, basic principles. And you see, for example, in the United States, you know, we have been the biggest victims in the world despite the advanced technology. So since March, we have very stable number of cases, nearly 20 to 30,000 cases. Now we have seen second wave coming, you know, there's a resurgence again. We stabilized, now we are coming back. Now we are seeing 45,000 cases a day now. So nearly with 5,000, uh, uh, four to 5,000 uh, uh, fatality rates. So uh, how to flatten the curve, you know, the microbial principle. So you have to reduce the R factor from three. The R factor three is a dangerous zone right now. Uh, you are in India and other countries. So the doubling rate is uh, one week. So with social distancing practice, you can reduce the R factor to at least uh, 1.5 or if not one, one. With one, it's best. So without mitigation. That's what's happened, you know, when you went out of the lockdown mode, you are without mitigation. During the lockdown, you are with mitigation. So during lockdown, you are in this green zone. Now you are in this zone. Now you don't know how to flatten this curve. Until you flatten this curve, I think you are going to overwhelm the system. And it's a very dangerous situation that is ahead of you right now in India, even for the US also for that matter. The daily cases in India are definitely under search because there is rapid uncontrollable cases I mean, these are only cases that you tested and found positive, 19,000, with 450 cases, positive deaths. So uh, you may have to open a large number of hospitals and then treat patients because now you will get into big, big pandemic zone. You know, the 10,000 hospital that, that was started last week in, in Delhi may not be even enough uh, because there are already 90,000 cases in Delhi. So the red, orange, green zone discrimination to, 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 to reduce the hot spots earlier, I think no longer applies because now there is no such thing as green zone. You know, you, even the villages where you have a couple of cases can be considered green zones, but I don't think you have any green zone anymore. Everything is a red zone right now. So that's what is an alarming situation. So not only the initial surge and mitigation, you know, there could be a secondary surge that may be coming, you know, if you don't continue to implement the mitigation, you might see resurgence. That's what the United States is seeing, okay? So now this is the last but one slide. So uh, to reduce the hot spots, so you have to understand uh, the three factors, uh, the host, okay? In the microbiology, the host and in the virus. When the host interacts with the virus, get the disease. 
So the more favorable the environment of this interaction, the more the disease is. So you have to cut down this interaction, create unfavorable environment through social distancing and hygiene and all the practices, so less disease. So this is a very fundamental thing to flatten the curve. So right now, I think a new social norm is coming, healthy behavior, okay? So focus the shift from government and public to individual. You know, you take the responsibility to take care of yourself and your family and be responsible for the community. So follow the scientific guidance, okay? Don't believe in all the gossips and WhatsApp and all those things. Follow the scientific guidance. What scientists are saying? When we are saying that virus is spreading rapidly, there's no vaccine, the vaccine is not in near future, you have to believe, okay? Not to believe people who are speaking in the TV or MLAs or MPs, you have to believe in the scientists who are speaking, okay? So my advice is you know, follow the scientific guidance like social distancing until at least a year more, uh, stay home if possible, stop the spread and save yourself, save your lives of your family and members. And what's the future? The future is a vaccination. So vaccines are under development. Widespread vaccination will be the end of pandemic, but it might take at least a year. Okay, You get ready yourself to stay alive until then. So once the vaccine comes in, we can end the pandemic. Until then, we have antivirals and they are symptomatic treatment to, to, to treat the disease in the hospital. Um, but they are only just like band-aids, okay? You get infection and then if you have good immunity, antiviral helps. Antivirals are not life-saving drugs at all. They only just kind of uh, uh, improves your recovery. If nothing works, herd immunity sets in. What is herd immunity? If a widespread infection happens, 60, 70 or 80, 90% of the people get infected and recover, or 80% of the people get vaccine and then don't get infection, that's called herd immunity. It's a very dangerous situation in the absence of a vaccine. Because imagine a town of, uh, say, for example, Vijayawada, and uh, uh, if 90% people have to be infected, quite a few people will die. So that's not a situation that's easy that nobody recommends a herd immunity. So that's why I think uh, until then, I think uh, we had to exercise uh, uh, the social distancing and all the precautions until a, a vaccine comes in. So I think I stop here and then uh, take uh, a few questions. Uh, I think it depends on, uh, on the time. Uh, thank you, sir. The, thank you. Thank you, sir, for the wonderful talk. Yes. And uh, we have a few questions, like two sure. to three questions to go with before uh, moving on to the next. Uh, and the first question is why we develop, why the vaccine against the virus is always difficult and tedious. Like yes. why developing a vaccine against the virus is always tedious and very difficult. Yeah, certainly, because uh, uh, viruses mutate so fast. Uh, for example, we don't even have a, virus, a vaccine for HIV. Okay? You don't have a vaccine for dengue that kills a lot of people. You don't have a vaccine for chikungunya in India. So vaccines mutate so rapidly. That's why we had to make vaccines every year. For example, flu vaccine uh, is a probabilistic estimation. You have vaccine, but it only works 50 percent. So even the COVID vaccine that is under trials right now, it's not 100 percent. So we will have a probability estimation of, hey, this could be the strain that may arise. So it could only work to 60 to 70 percent of the people. So that means uh, because of this mutation, because of the rapid uh, genetic changes, and because of all of these factors, so it's very hard to develop a very efficient vaccine for virus. Bacterial infection is different. You know, bacteria, you don't see this kind of problem. You know, uh, you see cholera, I mean, sorry, uh, the typhoid, you know, bees, you know, for example, you see the tuberculosis. So it's bacteria virus, vi versus virus. So virus are the dangerous things. That's why I think we have no way of uh, uh, getting a good vaccine, despite our best effort to, to understand the science. That's why understanding the viral science will be the key here to kind of develop the next generation. You know, we had to beat the viral uh, smartness with our smartness to come up with the strategy. Yes, sir. And uh, due to time constraints, I have like a couple more questions to finish. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah. 
So why more mutation occurs in the virus than any other infected organisms? Very good question. Actually, most bacteria and all, you know, they multiply, they retain the genomes faithfully, and then, you know, they don't recombine, recombine. Whereas viruses, you know, just like I showed you how they replicate, you know, for example, this virus or, you know, flu virus, you know, it, it's, it uncoats in the cytoplasm, you know, when, you have, when it uncoats, and then when it is uh, uh, replicating, all of these RNA particles, you know, and these genes are freely floating in the cytoplasm, you know, they can recombine with each other, you know, that's how you're basically cutting and pasting, cutting and pasting randomly. So that's how the mutations evolve in virus because the virus have a, a very high multiplication, high recombinant possibility. Bacteria, protozoa and all those organisms, you know, they are very faithful genomes. Uh, they don't uh, have this problem. That's why I think um, the mutations are, is, mutation is a very problematic thing in the virus. That's the inherent nature of uh, the, the viral genome. Thank you, sir. And uh, so there's another question. Um, so like they say that in some cases, one of the family members uh, were affected, you know, uh, affected with the COVID-19. And uh, but the remaining persons were found like negative, though they were in close association with the positive person. So how do you explain this? And uh, we do have seen recently uh, as a trend in several families. Uh, that's very hard to predict because what if uh, that person was exposed uh, uh, outside somewhere where the viral uh, load is very high in the air or aerosol or, or fomites, but uh, uh, when he came home, maybe he didn't transmit to the family. Maybe, you know, he was staying away or maybe they have a good hygiene, you know. It doesn't mean that if you're staying with a person that you get transmitted, you know. If you're following a good hygiene, you know, like washing hands, using excessive soap for everything, not inhaling the same air because in India, you, you don't stay close to home. You have windows and then you have fan going on. So... Your air is recirc your air is not recirculating in just like in the United States. You know we have centrally air condition. Our air recirculates. In your case, it doesn't recirculate. So, so highly probable that if person is infected and staying in their own home in their own room, uh, it's not necessarily that it will spread to to the persons uh, uh, in the family. But you are talking about a rare uh, cases. That's that's not the standard. The standard is that if uh, one gets a wife gets and husband gets and a husband gets wife gets you know it's it's because they, are, they 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 get very close enough so that uh, uh, they kind of inhale the same air but uh, uh, the exception is not the rule here the spread is pretty well worked out you know if uh, in in 10 minutes each time you breathe if you'd get 10 virus particles so in 1 minute uh, about uh, 20 breaths so 200 virus particles, okay? And in 10 minutes, that's a 2,000 virus particles. That's good enough. 2,000 virus particles entering your lungs will spread a massive infection. So if you're not getting that many, that means you get mild infection. But uh, if the, the, the spread, the viability, all those things are very well worked out. And that's why we see these communities spread uncontrollably. So when we talk about the spread and all these things, prevention, Let's talk about the 90% the uh, of the population rather than the exception. For example, not everyone dies even with a, se a severe infection. But people who have the mild infection are dying because they get pulmonary embolism. They get heart attacks. But that's not the case even for older people. You know, they still survive. So we'd, let's not talk about exceptions. So let's talk about the majority of the people. That way then we can spread the information, science rapidly and save more people. Yes, sir, that's a valid point. Um, and uh, one last question. Um, sure. So uh, there's a question from, uh, yeah, there's a question from Dr. S. Kalaiwani. And she says, like, according to the evolutionary theory, survival of the fittest is the rule. Since vaccine development is difficult and takes long time for phase four trial, why not we attempt herd immunity? So can you hear us? Yeah. 
Herd immunity yeah. uh, is easy to talk, but uh, it's a very dangerous concept. You know, right now, you only have uh, 5.5 lakh cases in India for a population of 130 crores. So that in herd immunity to take place, uh, you had to infect 100 crore people. How in the world you can achieve that? That's impossible. You know, it will wipe out uh, uh, 5 to 10 percent of the population. That means nearly 20, 20 crore people will die when we talk about herd immunity. Herd immunity should not be a conversation in our, in our scientific thing because it's a dangerous proposition. So if nothing works, uh, that's a herd immunity. But but things are working because 85 percent of the people are recovering that means they are mounting immunity and they are developing antibodies now they are the people they belong to the survival of the fittest category that's a natural it's not a natural selection we're not talking about genetics here and not a eugenics it's an immunity level these are the people who have good immunity good healthy status these are the people who are actively following the social distancing and good hygiene so these are the people who are kind of surviving will survive. People who are not listening to the scientists, who are making parties, who are doing rallies and protests, and they're not listening to the scientific conversation, even MLS, MPs getting infection, and having all of these parties and intelligence, and then all of these things, those are the people I think they'll get more and more infection. Not only they get it, they transmit to other public. So I think it's uh, when it comes to this virus, I think herd immunity is a dangerous conversation. And until we get the vaccine, we can't even talk. When we give vaccine, yes, herd immunity will take place if everyone is vaccinated. So that will at least take one to two years right now because you know, you know, nearly five billion people in the world need to be vaccinated. That's a lot of effort. Okay. So right now, the best way is individual care, you know, individual health. So even if you get exposed, you should be able to overcome the virus. Everybody has that capacity to overcome the virus. Even the aged people can also overcome the virus. So it's only a question of uh, having a very good healthy status right now, not take any chance to get the virus into your body. And then uh, even if it's there, then you should be able to fight it out. So that's what I think we are advocating right now. Uh, more, I mean, have a very good healthy uh, lifestyle right now for at least a year. I mean, don't worry about the business. Don't worry about anything else. Don't even take chances going out to the market or places anywhere, because first of all, you don't want to get a chance. Once you expo exposed, your family get exposed. You know your whole uh, thing. You know it, that's what I think uh, is happening right now. People are not listening to the seriousness that's going on. You know, early on, there are not many cases in India. They reopen, and then I see you know kilometers of line in front of a bar. You know. Why do you have to line up in the bar, or restaurant, and all those places with the virus chances? Why do you have to do these political, all these rallies and meetings and everything? It's spreading the virus. Now, there's no control right now. So that's what is happening right now. I think people have to take the responsibility and get very good immunity, save themselves, save their family for at least a year. And then those who survive this pandemic yeah, through individual responsibility, you can call them survival of the fittest. Thank you.